Right, so we are live. Hello and welcome everyone. This is uh, Luis Suarez. Welcome to episode 15 of the No Email Vodcast. Uh, you may have noticed how I am alone. Well, I'm not alone, really. Um, my co-host is not here because uh, she's actually Claire Bird. She's actually lost somewhere in Corsica enjoying holidays. So we're going to go ahead and steal on episode 15. And um, today I'm really thrilled because we have got the exciting opportunity to introduce an author of a very interesting book called Message Not Received. Uh, his name is Phil Simon. And Phil, say hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, Luis, thank you for having me. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I'm very excited about having you on the show here today because um, I don't know if folks can notice on the Hangout, but uh, please show a little bit of your T-shirt that you're wearing today. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Yes, email sucks. That's uh, the perfect fit. So, um, so here's what we're going to do, folks, today. So we have got, uh, we're going to do a bit of back and forth between Phil and myself. We're going to talk mainly about the book in terms of what, will, what are some of the major key um, items or insights that we have learned from reading the book. Uh, it's a book that I have read myself just recently. I can recommend it if you're doing any kind of business communication. So this is a, a broadcast episode that is not going to be just about email or no email. Uh, it's going to be a lot more. It's essentially about how do we improve business communications today because um, at least one of the things that happens on the book itself is that um, we're not doing very well, apparently. Right? Our messages may not be received, as, as Phil says. So a quick introduction about Phil. So Phil has been in the IT industry for a good while now. He has written several books, uh, one of them, The Age of the Platforms, I think it is, and the last one about the message now received, where he questions and he challenges all those folks or knowledge workers who are doing business communications, how we can make them better, how we can make them clearer, right? Uh, so Phil, if you want to add something else about your own biography that may have forgotten that is not included on the bio from the actual Hangouts, and then from the ones we can just kick it off. No, most of what I sent you is true. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, we need to make it a bit more interactive here, right? So obviously, I'm, I'm just kidding because I know we are because we have been talking about it a few times. So right. well, um, don't, don't believe Google. I was never convicted of that particular offense. I had a good uh, attorney. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. So God bless so, the right to be forgotten, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, there's a bit of a controversy in that um, over here in Europe, but that's probably another topic for another uh, broadcasting episode and everything else. So, um, so here's the thing. Um, the book message not received. Um, one of the things that we did on the previous episode when it was just clear myself announcing a new series of podcasts that we're going to do as part of the third phase of, of this podcasting series is talk about the various different phases around change, right? And for those folks who may have watched it a couple of weeks back, the actual number one step for that phase into change is um, anger, you know, being angry. And uh, Claire was mentioning something that I thought was really interesting because she knows you. She has a spoken with you as well. And when she basically knew that we were going to interview you for the message not received, and she made that correlation that the message not received has got a bit of a touch of anger or angriness in terms of how we actually perceive those communications. So to get the ball rolling, I thought how we could make the connection of that <laughs> anger feeling right. into why did you go for message not received as the title of the book? You want to delve into my anger issues. I thought that we were going to talk about business. You're not going to play my psychiatrist for an hour, but uh, let well, me know I need to send the invoice for being if my you look into, if, if So here's the thing, right? If you look into the book, there are several, you know, paragraphs where you state very clearly a state of anger in terms of how people abuse, not just email, but communications in general, right? In terms of all of the jargon that we use, all of the buzzwords, right. all of the hype, and how we overcomplicate things. So there's a little bit of angry, angriness in there. If I can yeah, say. Maybe, maybe just a tinge. I, I prefer to think of it as more um, uh, frustration or disillusionment. I mean, this isn't 1998. There are better ways to communicate than sending 75 email chains back and forth and obfuscating, uh, using words unnecessarily to confuse others, when the true meaning of the word communicate is to make common. 
So why assume that other people know what a cloud-based analytics platform is? What does that even mean? Um, so um, uh, my first book is about IT project failures, and 60% of those projects failed, and people generally knew what they were buying. It was an enterprise resource planning system, a customer relationship management system, whatever. You knew what you were buying and what you wanted to do with it. Well, what are the odds that you're going to be successful if you're buying some um, big data platform as a service? Right? Well, what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. So um, there are some stories in the book. Um, again, if this were 1998, the over-reliance on email might be a bit more understandable, but there are plenty of tools that I mentioned in the book, uh, whether it's HipChat or Slack or, uh, gosh, Asana, Basecamp, um, or old schools like the telephone to actually communicate. So I just thought that having written six books about business, data, and technology, I could write a book about the Internet of Things. That's very interesting to me. But I came to the realization, Luis, that unless we understood what we were talking about, all this data and technology didn't mean a hill of beans. So why not take a step back and put my particular spin on the problem of business communication? Because unlike previous books, say, on platforms or on big data, in which they were the first or one of the first books on the subject, 38 or 3,900 books on business communication had been written according to Amazon. So I knew that this wasn't the first attempt to articulate the problem, but I was unaware of a book that used my particular style and integrated case studies, looked at some of the companies, for instance, um, that we'll talk about later, that have actually moved from theory to practice. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't a pie-in-the-sky notion. Some companies that has, have actually said, along with some individuals, as you know, we're, we're not doing this over email. Uh, I was reading a story after the book came out about a company in France, I think it was a bank, whose CEO told the IT department, remove reply all on email. And the average person saved two hours a day and communication improved. <laughs> so um, I just, I, I, I see that it's not getting better. We continue to use jargon. The average person receives 120 to 150 emails per day. That number is increasing at about 15% a year. If you do the math, that will double in four and a half years. So something has to give. Either we need to change the way that we work and we communicate, or we need to put more hours into a day. And I don't think the latter is possible, but I'm not that smart. Exactly. And I, and I agree with you that we cannot put more hours into the day, especially when there are studies that are confirming that we're working more hours now than ever, right? Uh, so, so, you know, to me, when I read the book, there was a clear message there. At least the message that I received, and that's something that you question yourself at the end of the book, whether we, we got the message or not. But the message that I got overall from the presentation is that business communications are broken, right? Uh, from, from how you presented the book throughout not just the description of, of how corporate communications are done, but also some of the various different case studies that we will talk about shortly and everything else. The message that I, that, I, that I did get was business communications are broken. But what I found really interesting was that even though we know and we realize that business communications are broken, we know that email is broken, we still make use of it every day. I mean, I, I saw a tweet that you mentioned, I think it was a day or two ago, of a study done with 400 people Yes, I know, 400 the, people. The, the Adobe right? study that was just released. Yeah, the, the Adobe study, where it was saying that we spend six hours per day doing Yeah, I, I, I kind of question that particular number. Um, that seems a little high to me, but let's say that it's three. Um, right. If you legitimately have to spend three hours in email, then I'm okay with that. Maybe you're responding to actual queries. I know that you're off email and you want people to correspond with you through another mechanism. For example, with Twitter, you mentioned that you were open to anyone. Hmm. Well, as you know, Twitter, I think, sports around 300 million users. I question that number because I think a lot of them are bots and spam and Twitter's trying to up its stock price and blah, blah, blah. Right. My point is that if it's three hours spent in a productive way, then that's fine. But I would argue that most of the emails going back and forth could be resolved with a simple conversation or rather than putting it in someone's discrete inbox that essentially goes away if that person leaves the company, why not use a collaborative tool, like some of the ones I mentioned in the book, that way it's searchable. No, you don't wanna be putting Luis's performance review or a salary information there, but if you're trying to solve a problem, why wouldn't you wanna make that searchable? It's the reason, for example, if someone sends me a long email asking for my thoughts on something, I will usually direct them to one of the thousand blog posts on my site or an article I've written for one of my clients. I essentially want everything that I've written as much as possible to be there so other people can find it and maybe hire me. This right. notion that it has to exist in my inbox, I think, is 
very antiquated, very 1998. So why, why do you think it is so hard for people to change? I mean, clearly myself with a whole bunch of all the different guests that we have been having over the last few months, we understand that email per se is not a problem. It's a technology like just like any other, right? Mm -hmm. That it's us that is the problem, right? It's, it's right. our views of the system, it's our behavior, it's our mindset. You know, things, you know, when you mention about, you know, your approach or about what you do with your knowledge is very unique compared to what everyone else who uses email is doing because instead of you trying to open it up to make it available to everyone else, there are all of the, all the people who use email because number one, that's how they justify email and as their work, right? So if it didn't, if it didn't happen through email, it didn't happen, right. right? And the second one is, you know, by me using email, I basically protect and hoard my own knowledge because I only, re I only share with a small group of people and for a small instance. And I know that it's trapped in whatever the repository is that at one point in time, they're gonna go away. Whether I leave the company or they leave the company or whatever else, right? So, so why is it so hard for us human beings to change those bad habits. What there are a bunch of different thoughts? reasons, Luis. Um, I'd start with one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. In some mm. companies, that's just the expectation. In other instances, people are ignorant. They don't know that there are better ways to communicate. Um, they're so inured or ingrained with email that they can't imagine life without it. Some instances, people know that there are tools, but they're just too lazy to learn them. If you send, just say, 100 emails a day, 250 days a year, you're doing something 25,000 times. I would suspect that if you do something that many times, you're going to get good at it. Um, so I think that to your point, the reasons are mostly human. In some organizations, they will not allow you to use more collaborative tools, but that's less of an issue in an era of bring your own device. Um, if you want to text yeah. or set up um, you know, some type of collaboration environment with a colleague without IT knowing. Again, this is not 15 years ago. That really wasn't possible today. Um, there really is no excuse other than mm -hmm. we're, we're lazy or we're ignorant or we just don't feel like it. Um, typically, you might take a step back. It might take you a little while to understand how Slack uses hashtags or what a role might be in a different application. But once you learn it, you will take five steps forward. But many of us are too busy, even if we wanted to learn something, if we're drowning in email or the expectation is that you're going to respond to everything, this is why most Americans check their email on vacation. Americans don't take half of their allotted vacation time. Think about it. If you go away for five days and you get 100 emails per day, you come back Monday morning and you hadn't checked emails, you've got 500 messages. If you spend one minute on each message, that's an entire day, eight hours. And your email keeps piling up. So it is insane, but it is a choice. I can choose not to respond to everyone. Now, as I put at the end of the book, you're right, is my message received? Some cu cultures can't be fixed. You may find yourself leaving because you don't want to deal with this type of thing, but it's my firm belief that there is an increasing percentage of organizations that get it, mm -hmm. and hopefully my book will encourage others to re-examine the way that they're communicating. And then there will be more places in which constantly responding to email isn't the norm. And email, I don't eradicate, I'm not as extreme as you, I, I don't think that it should be eradicated. Um, I just believe that it should be confined to very specific instances. It should lead to a conversation. Um, I don't want to have to call you up and tell you a Dropbox link for a file. That's not, right. that's not saying to me. But it's also not saying for us to go back and forth over the course of a couple of years on a problem. One of my speaking engagements in the back and forth before the uh, talk, a company shared with me that it took them two years to resolve a data issue. Now, having been an IT consultant before, I can tell you that certain data issues are incredibly complex, as you know, but the interesting part of the story was that when this group from London and this group from San Francisco finally got together in person and talked, that complicated data issue that spent two years banding about over email was resolved within five minutes. So what wow. does that say about the effectiveness of email? It's uh, definitely not as good as we think it is. No, and actually, I, when you say that story, it reminds me of the message that you have for your logo you have on your T-shirt, that email just sucks, right? And that's a very clear example. So, so here's the thing. Um, that one of the points that you make in the book, which I think it is spot on, and it has come up as well in, in, in various episodes, is, is how we, we're now at a time when if anything, we do have a choice. I mean, you mentioned throughout the book how 
you know, there was a time perhaps when email was the only thing that we could use because that was the only thing that was available to communicate and everything else. But nowadays we have got a, a plethora of different tools and you mentioned several dozens of them and there are probably hundreds if not thousands of them that could actually help people improve the way they communicate, right? And, and not just the way they communicate, also the way they do and share social gestures, right? In terms of, you know, comments, ranking, right, rankings, ratings, likes, or whatever else, right? Um, the thing that, that I find interesting from the book was, if we do have a choice, in terms of all the different tools that we can use and everything else, why do we still resort to the what, what we think is the easiest choice, which is in this case the perception that is email, because it, like you said, if you have got someone doing 25,000 times the same thing, you better get good at it, right? But the thing is that we don't get good at it, because the example that you just mentioned now is how two years of back and forth of email right. was fixed in a five-minute conversation. Well, I think that we're efficient at it, many instances, but it's not effective, and there is a difference, right? right. The fact that I can respond to an email and that goes out and my position is, is on the record is one thing. But whether or not that's the best tool is a separate matter. Again, I go back to people and culture. We love to demonize email the same way we love to demonize PowerPoint. You and I have both seen some absolutely atrocious PowerPoint slides. <laughs> yeah. But I like to say that we should blame the Indian, not the arrow. No one forces us to use 10-point fonts in a PowerPoint slide any more than anyone forces us to respond to an email. So in the book, I advocate following a three-email rule after three we talk, and I will invoke it. A true story, when I was putting together the book tour back in February, I was dealing with a PR firm representing a company whose name I won't mention. And after about four emails back and forth, I invoked my rule and provided my phone number and a link to my schedule that you can book online. Mm -hmm. I said, let's, let's have a conversation. Her response, too busy, can't talk, have to do this over email. And I laughed for a minute and broke my own rule and responded with, the irony isn't lost on me here. You represent a company that's trying to promote collaboration software, yet you will only talk to me, quote unquote, over email. So uh, some people you just can't reach, uh, to paraphrase from the movie Cool Hand Luke, but right. we, we can choose where we work. If you believe that email is a problem, you can try to introduce new tools. Again, this is not uh, 15 years ago. You don't have to spend millions of dollars and go with Microsoft SharePoint. Now there are many free or um, uh, freemium-based tools because of software as a service or open source software cloud computing. If you just want to use, say, HipChat or Slack in your department, you can do that in theory. Um, you don't need the entire organization on it. So uh, we choose the tools that we use, and we could fight this or we can embrace it and uh, call me a contrary and you wouldn't be the first. But um, this problem has a solution. It may wind up irritating some people. You may wind up leaving your job or your company. But I do believe that it's an, a better alternative. And if pressed, if you took two companies, A and B, everything being equal, and never is, but one embraced truly collaborative tools and one did not, and they're the same profit margin, same industry, et cetera, et cetera, I would bet on the first company any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. So, so here's the thing. So we are broadcasting live. We have got some viewers. We have got some live questions. And I'm going to go through uh, one of the questions that I think is, is very timely in terms of that scope of choice and, and what would you know, someone do, right? So the question comes from Marie-Louise Collard. And she says, if the CEO of a global business wish, wishes to post an important message to all staff, and he or she knows the ESA is in place, will not reach everyone, as not everyone is necessarily locked into you or, or use it, what would they use other than email? Why couldn't everybody be on one of the tools? That's a great question, answering that question. It's, it's, it's the perception that, I think it's, it's, it goes back to your book as well, right? And you, in your book you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, message not received, which we have got this, this notion that just because you send the email, everyone perceives that, you know, the person receives it and reads it. Well, we all know we don't because we have got a job right. to do. Yeah, it's, it, I think it is a change in mindset. Um, you know, if the CEO sends that very important message, but it's one of 500 messages I received that day, then it's very possible that I don't get it. But what if that were to appear kind of like with, with Facebook or uh, Twitter, you see an icon or Slack or HipChat or whatever, you see a, an important notice that you have to read or something is flagged in one of those applications as must read. 
you're distinguishing it from all the other messages. I know that you can set up filters and folders, and I've sent, by my estimations from the book, four or 500,000 business-related emails in my life. So I get it, there are ways of doing it, but I think that the question um, gets to a really important point about the executives. And if as an executive you don't use these tools, you're implicitly communicating to everyone else that they don't have to use them either. I would flip that question with what if the CEO introduced a new tool and everyone had to read it in that new tool or consistently referred people back to that tool when they wanted to engage in conversations over email. Um, there's a lot to be said, particularly in brownfield companies as opposed to greenfield ones. If you look at a lot of startups, they won't even go down this path with, with email because they realize that there are better ways to do things. The problem is in mature organizations that have a 20 or 30 year history and they've gotten used to email, it works well enough for them, maybe there are other tools that are better in some way, but you know what, I don't have time to do with that right now. So I, I agree with the larger point that the CEO or chief executive sets a tone for the rest of the organization. And if that person doesn't get it, it's easy for others to fall in line and say, well, why should I do this? You know, and, and I want to mention this uh, as, a, as a short story as well for, for my readers because, you know, we have this perception again that if we send the email, people will read it. And if it comes from the CEO, even more so, right? Well, the perception is also partially true when you start using an, an, an enterprise social software tool, right? Because I remember, for instance, back when I was at IBM, um, in 2012, the company CEO, Gini Rometti, uh, started you know, using the internal social enterprise collaboration tool to communicate with the rest of the employee workforce. And, uh, you know, it was her first year on tenure, and that was her first message. And typically, what you would expect is that she would go and fire an email to the entire company. She didn't. She created yeah. a community, and inside of the community, there was a blog, and within that blog, there was a video blog post where she recorded herself for three minutes, I think it was, if I recall correctly, three, four minutes, where she basically stated the three priorities for her for the year, right? And she published it. There was no communication on the corporate internet. There were no emails about it. Within two, three weeks, there were over 200,000 reads of that blog post with over 750 comments and likes and whatever else. And people were saying to me, like, yeah, but it didn't reach the 500,000 or 600,000 employees with contractors and business partners and everything else. And I said, yeah, but don't you think that there was already like critical mass in there if, if half the population read the actual blog post and they had this, all the buzz going about it with the word of mouth and the viral effect of saying, oh my God, our CEO is blogging kind of thing, right? So, so I, would, I would say that, you know, just because they may not be there on the social tool, it doesn't necessarily mean that the message is not going to be received. You know, I think one of the good points that I can make in correlation to, to the book as well is that if the content is good, people will find it eventually, regardless of whether it's on one social tool or the other. The problem is that in most cases, on email, you won't find it, especially when, for instance, the employee leaves the company, right? right. So, so, and I agree 100% with you in terms of that, you know, um, executive support, which is nice because sometimes you have got this nice, lovely leadership and sponsorship from the executive saying, oh yeah, you guys can go ahead and do that, and here's the budget, here's your purchase and everything else. But I think we're reaching the state where we need something more. We need, we need to translate from words into actions, and it's, you know, the lovely pat on the back and off you go is no longer enough, unless we get those executives to actually right. lead by example there will be a fraction of the population that they will say, well, if our executive, chief executive doesn't do it, why should I, right? That's true, but there are people in larger organizations who will not wait for chief executives to get it. We've all heard of the term shadow IT and this notion that I'm going to start a private Slack or hip chat community to get something done because IT is not giving me the tools that I need. Um, or they're evaluating different vendors and in two years, they're going to launch a new application, but we've got a deadline to meet. Um, in fact, uh, one of my favorite stories in the book comes from a guy who um, was working at AT&T, and HR kept bothering him to take training classes. And for those of you who haven't read the book, um, he kept getting nasty emails. So he wound up playing the video, hitting mute, minimizing the window, 
and then going back to work. He never heard from HR again. That just illustrates the point that all of our messages aren't received. Just to, to use your example, just because you sent out 500,000 emails doesn't mean that they were read. And it's easy to look at a statistic like 200,000 views for a video and go, well, it didn't have the same penetration that email would have received. But uh, Mark Twain once famously said, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. If you want to look for a reason not to do something, the data is there. Um, I'm sure that if you Google enterprise um, collaboration failures or Slack failures or whatever, you'll come up with something. But as I mentioned, there are more and more companies that are taking advantage of this because it works. It's better. I was just reading an article about how the New York Times built an internal tool on top of Slack to help them determine not only how to develop stories, but how to share them over different social channels. So um, like anything else, there's an adoption curve. And many of these large companies are not early adopters. But you can't tell me while Slack may be new, you know, companies like Yammer have been around for five or six years. There's a reason that Microsoft paid, I think it was $1.2 billion for it back in, I think it was 2010, when Microsoft owned SharePoint. The difference is that SharePoint is very much top down and Yammer was very much bottom up. So to me, it's not necessarily, we, we, we would love to do this if only the CEO got it. No, you can, in fact, start at a much uh, smaller, more granular level, if you like. Right. So, so you mentioned that there are a number of different companies or more and more companies that are doing this. So in the book, A Message Not Received, there are three companies that you actually listed as, as really interesting case studies. So we have got there Click Health, uh, Sidecar, and PR 2020. Um, they're tremendously powerful stories. Um, and I want to ask you a question in general about the three of them. But uh, before that, while I was preparing today's episode and everything else, there was something that struck me as, as remarkable in terms of how sometimes we don't even know how to sell ourselves. And I mean that in the most generous sense, in the most positive sense, right? Because, you know, plenty of people, you know, that I have been in touch with over the course of the years, they know that I haven't done email for about eight years now, right? And that I'm having a very strong advocate, perhaps a bit of a radical and everything else. And when I was reading the book, and you mentioned there how Click Health has been using this policy of no intranet, intranet email, so no internal email, for over a decade. And I'm thinking, like, where the hell did these guys work? You know, like, you guys should have been out there already 10 years ago telling the whole world, we're not doing email. We're using this nice, lovely application that we have built called Genome that does a tremendously amount of really good work to make us work more effectively. Why is it so hard to publicize the good stories, the success stories, versus just focusing on the failures? Well, that's a good question. I, I wish that I knew the answer. I'm not that <laughs> smart. Um, it, was, it certainly received some publicity because I heard of them. And I actively, as I do with all my books, seek case studies. I'm a big believer in show me, don't tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the best business books contain a number of things. Uh, first up, um, I'm a big fan of data. So don't just assume that email is a problem. And I go through and I did my research and show that the numbers are increasing, et cetera, et cetera. But data in and of itself doesn't necessarily tell a story. So I'm a big believer in case studies. I also, as you know, like obscure quotes. And then, yes, I have my opinions and feel free to disagree with them, but at least my opinions are rooted in fact. To me, it's just lazy if you're writing a blog post that cites a statistic and you don't link to it. Or if you're writing a book, you don't put in a footnote that this is where you're getting the information. But Genome's a great story because it has evolved. And it all started in back, I believe, in 2002 or 2003 when the company was fairly new. And the CEO said flat out, we're not using email internally because it's the best way to let other people plan your day. That's pretty much a quote verbatim, and it's one of my favorite in the book. So there was this recognition at the upper levels. But in fairness, there was also frustration at the lower levels because, as I point out in the book, uh, many people would open a ticket with IT and then send an email and then tap them on the shoulder to go, did you get that? And that drove <laughs> them crazy because why are you doing both? Um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and no one, if they're really busy doing something, wants to be tapped on the shoulder with something as um, uh, mundane as that. So there was the highest uh, recognition at that company that something had to give. But I, I hope that books like mine and, and case studies and people like yourself have received some nice publicity. I read The Wired piece a while ago. Um, will help raise awareness that there is another way. Again, even with Click, they use email externally, 
But think about it. If you're communicating with a client or a prospect or a partner, eventually perhaps you bring that person in to your tool, your network, whatever. But this notion that it needs to be the default means of internal business communication, I think, is uh, very misplaced. And it ignores the fact that there are better tools out there. If you go back to 2000, sure, we saw some corporate intranets, but they were kind of clunky and a lot of people didn't use them. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, the tools are so much easier. And, and here's the other thing, Luis. We pretty much use these types of tools every day with social networks. A lot of these things, uh, there's a case study on PR 2020, a PR firm in um, Ohio. It's basically like Facebook for work with right. the tags and the at symbols and the hashtags. So th this notion that there's going to be a, a, a two-month learning curve is, is insane. So to me, the squeeze is worth the juice. But um, these are all companies with the case studies that recognize this fairly early on, that they needed to do something different. As I mentioned, the challenges, and I spoke to many uh, large organizations in trying to get case studies. A lot of them even said, look, we would love to get to where you are, but we just can't right now. So as usual, it comes down to people. Uh, when I try to explain my books to people, um, I try to say that they're not technology books per se. They're about the intersection of people, business, data, and technology. And as usual, the tools are there. The question is, are we willing to embrace them? So uh, my background is very much um, kind of a mix of a bunch of different things. I don't just espouse the benefits of these different tools in a vacuum. These tools need to be used in real life. And in real life, there are challenges and problems because we're human beings. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's, that's the, the whole point behind the, the three case studies that you mentioned in the book, that there are actually folks, there is, a, is, a, is, you know, three companies who basically decided we need to put some action into this, right? We know that we need to improve the way we collaborate, the way we communicate, you know, we have got jobs to do, and the less friction that we have in, yes. in how we interact amongst each other, the clearer the message will be, right? And, and then you have got Click doing that, you have got Sidecar, which is another interesting use case because, or case study in this case, sorry, I should say, uh, and I should correct myself, <laughs> right? Um, the Sidecar is interesting because they have actually built it around a community, right? right. Uh, yeah, and, and it's actually, right. and, no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Uh, it's interesting, about three or four months ago, Sidecar changed its model. For a while it was trying to compete with Uber and Lyft, but now it's getting into the delivery business, but they're still reliant upon drivers who aren't proper employees. There's no reason that this tool can only be used by proper W-2 or, or full-time or part-time employees. You can use them with independent contractors, and that's, that's exactly what the company did. Relying exclusively on Facebook just didn't make any sense for a bunch of different reasons. Number one, Facebook owns the data. Right. And what's to stop Facebook from, in the feed of a sidecar driver, showing an ad for Uber and poaching their employees? Well, Uber is not above very aggressive business tactics, as you know. But it didn't have any control over the app. It couldn't control the news feed. So why not spend the time, and they went with Jive Software, another mm -hmm. very powerful collaborative tool, and built something such that the only email that its drivers would ever receive was the first one. And then with that, because it's a mobile first company in a way with the drivers being out in the field, you would never have to send another email again. And then they were smart enough to realize that you're not going to have it all figured out from the beginning. They very much embrace agile or, or lean methods. For example, they didn't know early on, this is one of my favorite stories from the book, um, that this community, they created the garage, right? It's called Sidecar. Well, right. the, at the garage, you need to make an occasional pit stop. In other words, when nature's call came, where was the nearest public bathroom? And they responded to the feedback early on going, hey, it would be really neat if I didn't have to drive around in circles or use a different app. If right inside the community, I could see, oh, wow, there's a McDonald's here or a Burger King. So um, I like this notion that you throw something out there and it generally works, but then you respond to feedback. And that to me is a much better way of developing an app. And you're also showing that you're listening to your users. You're moving potential conversations away from email, which is where way too many people spend way too much time, and into something that makes more sense. Because you know what? Rather than responding to the same email 100 times, why not create an FAQ or something searchable in which you just search for bathroom and there it is. Why do I want someone at a help desk responding, opening a ticket, we received your message, what do you need? Even a chat session. Why not automate that? We live in an age of self-service, right? How many Google searches are conducted every second? It's quite a few. People want to search for themselves. To me, 
you might need to talk to someone, don't get me wrong, if you have mm -hmm. a question that can't be addressed or it's personal or contains sensitive information. But for the most part, you want your drivers, in this case a sidecar, in the field driving people and making you money, not stopping and calling or trying to, you know, being confused. So to me, it's just a better way of doing business. I don't believe in the benefits of communication tools in and of themselves. All technologies, all tools help us run a better business. Our employees right. will be less frustrated. There are benefits to this other than just saying, I did away with email. Well, congratulations, what do you use instead and does it really help you? To me, it's a much more pragmatic approach than just buying the fanciest, shiniest tools and throwing them out there, but no one ever uses them. True. And you know, the, 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 the really cool thing about Sidecar is that it proves that even the non-traditional organizations, because Sidecar is non-traditional organization, as you would explain, can benefit from thinking out of the inbox, if I can say that, and use the smarter tools more effectively like you have showcasing here, right? And, and the use case that you mentioned about the bathroom breaks, there's actually a, 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 a term for it, which is exaptation, which is essentially find new uses for an application or tool or whatever else that even the developers didn't think about it, right? And in this case, is a, a, a need that they had that it was provoked by having the conversation and then having all centrally stored in the garage where they could go and query it any, more, any other time, right? And, and what I really like about the, the case study from Sidecar is that the focus was on the end user, in this case, the driver, which is a need for myself as a company, I need to help you be doing your job for the longest time that I can. So I need to, again, reduce the frictions to the point of taking them away. Don't distract you away from what your job is, which is basically being on the road, right, with your car. And, and eventually still have that sense of community that you can collaborate and communicate with people while you're on the move, mainly, mainly meaning your mobile phone, right? I, I would argue that if, unless Sidecar embraced a tool like Jive, and it could have been something else, um, after a while its drivers may have been frustrated. Why am I only interacting with you over email? Or why do you make me sign up for Facebook? I don't want to be on Facebook for whatever reason, right? right? So again, the tools enable the business, and yeah. if the company moves in a different direction as it has, then the tools might as well. But you know, I um I don't buy it that we won't, we have to use email. I understand network effects. I understand that everyone has an email address except for you, um, and I'm not anti-email. But why? It's funny. One of my friends um, gave me some feedback on the book, and he, he wrote a blog post about it. And candidly, he told me, I like the book, but why can't you just tell me how to write a better email? And I stopped him and said, I'm so glad you asked me that question. First of all, that book has been written before. You can do a Google search and you know, every day I see something on Harvard Business Review or Inc. about effective email tools. I want to write the book that makes you think, why am I sending this email in the, be in the beginning? Right? Is this the right way? Before you hit return or send, Ask yourself why you're doing this. Ask yourself if you should pick up the phone. Ask yourself if you should embrace one of these tools. You know, going into jargon, ask yourself if you need to use all these fancy terms when you, people won't understand them or it's unlikely. Ask yourself if there isn't a simple way of doing it. You may decide, you know what, Phil, I like the book, I read the book. I don't believe in your three email rule. Mine's gonna be five, or I'm gonna forget that rule because somebody lives in China and the time difference is too much and I have to translate what that person sends me because I don't necessarily understand the person's English that well. Hmm. Make your own rules, but question why you're doing it. Um, th this notion that we only have to use email for communication, I think is ridiculous. You know, it, it, that aligns quite nicely with another question that came up, uh, again from Mary Louise Collard, um, where basically she's stating how for as long as email is intimately aligned with social tools, employees will still continue to use email, right? Um, and I agree with, with you that if you certainly put together, uh, you know, rules to me is a very strong word, so I prefer to call them guidelines, right? So you're basically trying to entice people to do things in a different way, right? And, and I'm thinking, you know, based on that reflection and question from, from Mary Louise and what you just said now about the introduction of those rules and guidelines and everything else, whether we collectively, as, as knowledge web workers, if I can call ourselves that, we probably haven't worked enough or hard enough 
in providing the right conditions for that shift to take place. So if, if you know, if we tell people, here's the, here's the enterprise social software tool, here's the email, go ahead and use it. I know what people are gonna do. They're gonna go to the 25,000 messages that they have sent out already. Whereas if you actually stop and tell people, hey, here's a different way of how we can work together. Let me show you how it actually works. Let's figure out examples of how we actually interact in the day-to-day -day with tasks and activities and whatever else, and see how we can figure out in a different world environment than what email is doing. I suspect that if we actually become more proactive in doing a bit of hand-holding, a bit of coaching, and helping people understand how there are better ways, that we will have probably a lot more success than just saying, hey, here's a tool, go ahead and use it. Yeah, right. and, and I think that stories really help in that regard. It's one of the reasons I believe in case studies. You may not believe me when I say that there are better tools out there, but at, in chapter eight of the book, I go through those, those three case studies, and you may say, well, that doesn't apply to us, or I couldn't see us using that in this particular instance, but maybe this would work over here, right? Like I said, I'm not against email. I don't think that it should be eliminated, but I think that it is one club in the bag. There's an expression, if you only have a hammer, everything is a nail. <laughs> well, why, for me, I use a bunch of different tools. I just um, finished an upgrade of my website and working with my developer, we didn't send a single email. I used a very simple task management application called Todoist. Is it a full bone project management application like an Asana or a Basecamp? Absolutely not. But I wasn't dealing with 10 different people. I was dealing with one person. So I could isolate the tasks. We could track our uh, back and forth. I can put in an image. And I don't have to go into an email box that has 35,000 emails trying to find the one from him that relates to this. It's all contained and I get alerts on my smartphone and my iPad. I can make updates and it all synchronizes. That doesn't mean that I would never send him an email. Um, towards the end of the project, I wound up sending him an endorsement that he put on his website. So to me, um, if you say, well, I can't get rid of email altogether, therefore I will never use one of these other tools, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm not saying you have to try every tool I mentioned in the book. As you, as you mentioned before, there are probably thousands of them out there. But there is a, a table in, I think it's chapter five or chapter six, mm -hmm. that yep. lists a bunch of different tools. So if you and I, let's say you don't have an international plan, I can get on Skype, I can get on Google Hangouts. Um, if I don't have a um, proper calendar application, then I can use You Can Book Me or calendar.ly. So take a look at a lot of these tools if your organization doesn't provide them and then maybe adopt them or ask your organization, is this something that would benefit us? Um, so I don't believe that there is a Swiss army knife of tools, but that's exactly how most of us are using email today. It is our sure. project management app. It is our task management app. It is our collaboration tool. It is our scheduling tool. And I'm telling you, that is insane. It is. It is. And I think, I think that the key word that both you and me probably haven't mentioned that is, is descriptive of what the problems that we have here is that context defines what you use for a tool to achieve a certain goal. The problem with email is that it doesn't have any context because everything goes, right? But when you start picking up the different interactions that you do, whether with your clients, with your business partners, or whether you're with, you know, your colleagues, and you define what that context is, and what needs to be done, and then you look into the choices that you have with the tools versus thinking by default, I'm gonna go and do email because it's the one that everyone would pick up. I, I would bet that there would be lots of guarantee that you will be better off eventually over the course of time, yeah. right? Are you a tennis player by any chance? I'm not. <laughs> okay. In tennis, every shot is contextual. Right. It's the same thing with communication. Um, in some instances, I had someone when I was doing my book tour in Dallas, Texas, ask me what I thought about emo uh, emojis and emoticons. Are they unprofessional? Well, again, it all depends. If this is your first email or interaction or text message with the CEO of the company and you throw in seven emojis, guess what? Forever in that person's head, you will be emoji person. But if you and I have known each other for four or five years and we've exchanged hundreds of interactions on Twitter, or Facebook, email, whatever, and you know how I'm wired, then you're less likely to assume the worst. So I can't say, and in the book, I stop short of a lot of the rules that you mentioned. They are more guidelines. Think mm -hmm. about this. Don't, you know, I'm not a big believer in using scheduling for email 
But if you're in a pinch and I say, I'm free all day Tuesday, pick a time, that's a lot different than I can do it Tuesday from one to four, Wednesday from six to eight. Well, I can do it here. Trying to match them up is like putting a square peg in a round hole. And I use You Can Book Me. I make my calendar available, integrates with Google Calendar. Privacy settings are there. I'm either free or I'm not. You don't know where I am. You don't know what I'm doing. And it takes into account time zones. And then we will typically only exchange that email. And then we set it up. And then after that, we actually can communicate in person. We forget that if we're sending email, let's assume you actually received and read the email. Any text-based communication lacks, as you mentioned, context. You don't see someone's facial expressions. You don't hear someone's tone of voice. And you can't tell. There's, there's research I cite in the book uh, by a couple of guys in 2006, uh, one from New York University and one, I believe, from the University of Chicago, about how only 56% of the time do we completely and accurately interpret someone's message over email. It's basically a coin flip. And I would challenge those who believe that we don't, we're too busy to pick up the phone if you want to risk a massive uh, failure or a misunderstanding because you were too uh, busy or lazy or whatever to do that. To me, it's not worth the risk. You can still have miscommunications in person or virtually, but the odds are much lower. And I'm a big believer in probabilistic thinking. Do what you can to maximize the chance of success. Um, as I mentioned in all my books, you can ignore all the vice in my book and still be successful, or you can follow it and still fail. But it's like going to a casino, and if you play blackjack, you probably shouldn't hit on 18 when the dealer shows a six. You could win, but that's probably not a good idea. That's true. So, so you know, typically what we do in this, 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 this podcast is we're also trying to make it practical for folks who are listening, right? And um, um, as we're coming close to, to the end of the episode, I would love you from message not received for you to pick up the top three tips that you will give out to anyone out there who is starting to question the status quo of email as no longer the king of communication, the king of collaboration, but just one, one more of the pack, one more of the umbrella of options that we have. So what would be your three major tips that you could go and share with folks here that we can use to wrap up the episode? I would ban urgent emails. If something is really urgent, pick up the phone. There's no such thing as an urgent email. Oh, it was urgent. You didn't get that? Well, it was urgent, but it was at the top of a, and I was at the bottom of my email chain. So that's number one. And number two, I ascribe to a three email rule. After three, we should talk. Feel free to tweak that if you like. If I sent the wrong file, maybe I'll send the right file this time. So technically, I'm sending more than three in total. Um, and then embrace these other tools. You know, download Yammer or Slack or HipChat or Basecamp, and these are either free or they work on a freemium model. And I can't tell you, some people have said, what's the best collaboration tool? I can't tell you that. Right? I can tell you what works for me, given a particular situation or particular context, but it is not 2000. Um, you don't have to sign a contract and have a bunch of consultants like I used to be come and spend a whole bunch of money, hit the switch and cross your fingers. Hopefully it works and people will like it. You can try these tools out very freely and see if they take root. If you happen to like a feature of Yammer and you go with that or you wish that Slack did something else, maybe use both of them. You don't want to use 20 different tools for 20 different reasons, but the opposite is also true. Using email for everything just because it's convenient and we know it well because we use it every day. Um, I think is the very definition of insanity. So with regard to email, those are my three. I've got a whole bunch on jargon, but I know we're running short on time. I know, I know. But, but let me ask you something else because, and I, and I read a, a, re, a recent uh, interview that you did as well on the Huffington Post with um, another lady, I can't remember her name now. The about phone the power, lady. About, yeah, exactly. About the power of using the phone. Uh, so you're an advocate of the phone at a time when we loathe and we hate talking on the phone. Right. The irony is we use our phones more than ever, just not for talking. So, so give me, give me a, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm probably going to be asking the, 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 the obvious question here, but why pick up the phone at a time when we hate working with the phone? Because sometimes you'll actually resolve a problem before it gets too serious. I'll, I'll give you an example of one that um, I've heard about recently. One of my favorite bands is actually based in your neck of the woods. Uh, they're called Marillion, and they've been around since about 1979, 1980. And they're one of my favorite bands. They've played thousands of shows together over three decades, um, almost 20 studio albums. And 
about two years ago, I got a chance to interview the keyboardist of the band, a guy by the name of Mark Kelly, nice guy. I met him in Montreal a few months ago. Uh, great band, great music. And he shared to me a story before I did the interview with him for Huffington Post on Skype. I was asking him about the band and the new album, and he said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. But I, you, you're working on a new book about communication and email. Tell me a little bit about it. And I explained the book, and he said, that's interesting because um, the band recently had a tiff, and it seemed like the drummer, a guy by the name of Ian Mosley, was upset with everyone because he responded in email, and they thought, oh, that was kind of harsh. So they, they all got on the phone, and they said, hey, what's, what's wrong? He said, nothing. Why? Oh, we thought from your email that you were upset. Now, think about it. This is a band that's been together for 34, 35 years. They've been to each other's weddings. They've spent thousands of nights together touring the world, playing in front of all these people. And they still have a misunderstanding over email. What does that mean when, forget 35 years, you've worked with someone for 35 days? What are the odds that you're going to have a misunderstanding over email that could lead to something? So I love that story. And it was the band's fine. But... I, I like telling it because if it can happen to people who've known each other for more than half of their lives, you're telling me that it can't happen with someone who's been with the company for three months? Right. And maybe they don't speak the same language and they haven't spent all this time together. So, uh, you know, I, I think that you can communicate well at certain times, but you, again, you're, you're rolling the dice here. And if it doesn't work for uh, guys who've been together for so long, what are the odds that it's always going to work for everyone in an organization all over the globe? maybe some people who don't speak English as a native language. It's just, right. it's just silly. So yes, occasionally pick up the phone. Yes, I was going to, I was going to say that. I'm, I'm a big advocate of the phone, and, and, but mine is a, bit, is a bit more of a pragmatic, and that is that I talk faster than I can type. So I can, I can relate more of what I want to say in, in a shorter time span and, and still get the message across. And obviously, sometimes, you know, using the voice, the audio, it, it's a lot more than just a bunch of words and a piece of text, right? Uh, in terms of, of what you're trying to You've to got sense. context, you've got tone of voice, you've got inflection. Um, if you're doing video, then you've got facial expressions. I can see, you might say, oh, that's really interesting, but you're nodding your head. You genuinely look like you're interested. That's a lot yeah. different than that's really interesting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, that's perfect. Ending of the episode, because here we're confirming that email is no longer just the king of the road. Uh, there are a lot of options there. Even picking up the phone to clear out whatever misunderstandings and everything else. Old tools so, and new tools. Yeah, exactly. So um, final wrap-up thoughts that you may have, feel that we may not have mentioned so far. Um, you want to share? Yeah, just um, you know, plenty of information is on my website, philsimon.com. On Twitter, I'm at philsimon. Um, there's an audio book now. Uh, my first audio book, the previous six books, didn't have one. So a sample's on my website, plenty of blog posts. And... You know, share your stories. If you want to tweet at me with hashtag message not received, I don't. I know that Twitter increased its direct message limit to ten thousand, which to me is just like email. I, I've said to people, <laughs> shoot me if I ever send a direct message in Twitter that gets anywhere near ten thousand characters, because you're just shifting the problem from one medium to another. But yeah, uh, share the stories. I'd, I'd love to hear them. Uh, I think that I'm, I'm not the only person who experiences this frustration. And give the book a shout. I, I think um, with the case studies and the tools that I mentioned in the book, even if it can help you 20% of the time and to take some of your time back, you know, work does not necessarily have to mean constantly responding to email. Um, there is a difference between working smarter and working harder. And there's nothing wrong with embracing some of these tools. You might actually like them. Yep, and, and actually that's one of my favorite motors about working smarter, not necessarily harder. So, so thanks very much, Phil, for joining us. I had a couple of private comments coming through that they appreciate really the episode and, and your insights. And I strongly recommend message not received to those folks who want to improve the way they communicate. That was one of my major uh, aha key moments of learning throughout the book is that um, I have got a lot of work to improve in terms of how I communicate with people. And a new book has been an excellent guide. So, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Folks, we will be back in two weeks' time again with another episode. This time, Claire will be back from holidays. Uh, we probably won't be talking much about no email. We'll probably be talking about Corsica and what she did there. Uh, and we will talk about uh, the different phases of change where we will move in second, from, onto the second one from angriness that we had today, or anger today. So, um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Phil, again, for joining us. And we'll see you guys soon in two weeks.